Okay, if everybody could uh, be quiet, we're going to get started. I'd like to welcome all of you here. Um, it's so great to see you. This is our first um, Contemporary Council Town Hall meeting for the school year. We have quarterly town halls starting in September, then we'll have one in November, February, and April. So we hope you can come to all four. I'd like to um, issue a special thanks to Sharon Trill with My Mountain Town. She's videotaping the back. This will be on her website, and you can see that at the bottom of your agenda. So please, you know, go there, and she has all kinds of fabulous information. She's not only videotaping the meeting tonight, um, but she is our sponsor, and so we really thank her for her community support um, for tonight's Conifer Area Council Town Hall meeting. So, yes, if everybody would like to clap, that would be great. I'm thinking we might have a few faces that have not been here before, and I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, Conifer Area Council. We are a non-political organization that does not support or oppose any development, issue, political agenda, individual person, or business. We've asked all of our speakers to include these values in their presentations and to be nonpartisan, non-controversial, and to present just the facts. So we've also asked our speakers, and now I'm asking all of you as members of the audience, not to campaign for any person or issue while in this meeting. Okay? And there, um, as all of our meetings, there will be no questions or comments during the presentations, but we will have an open house format starting at 8 o'clock, um, and at that point you can go up to any of the speakers, um, the Sheriff's Department is here, um, a lot of people to talk to, and you can go up and ask questions, um, you know, give them comments, whatever you'd like to do at that point. So, what is going on around here? You know, at my house, we received some very needed moisture in the last week. And it is hard for me to even imagine the devastation all around us. Um, but Steve Harrelson, our representative from CDOT, is right in the middle of the devastation. He's trying to figure out how to get roads and bridges passable again, and was unable to make it tonight. So he felt really bad. He wanted to apologize to you all because he's in all of our meetings. Um, but he wanted to let you know that he will be at our November meeting, and he'll give a really good update at that point. Bruce Daly, who is our RTD representative, was also unable to make it tonight, but we, well, he will be here in November also. However, Dawn Smith, with the, she's the director of the Comfort Area Chamber of Commerce, she is here and she's going to talk a little bit about the Chamber of Commerce. Oh. You are too kind. Hey, I have kind of for souvenirs with me tonight. Remember how you voted for slogans? Well, I have only one natural high kind of for Colorado t-shirt left, but I do have several Elevate Your Life kind of for Colorado t-shirts if you'd like. And it, that was just fun. And the third t-shirt that will be made will say, 8,278 feet closer to heaven, kind of for Colorado. <laughs> so, it's, so come see me. I also have brand new Highway 285 Foothills Adventure maps. So that includes all the fun things to do between Z470 and 285, all the way to Jefferson City, almost a fair place. So if you're new in the area, please come by. And I also have other information at the Chamber office. So come on by if you're newly relocated. Next Thursday, if I have any beer drinkers in the room, is our fourth annual Conifer Octoberia Fest. That's Octoberia Fest. And it's at Brooks Place from 4.30 to 7.30, and it's, ironically, a scholarship fundraiser for our high school scholarship fund. So come on out, 25 breweries, over 50 craft beers, and Stan Fox, we have your hand, Stan Fox has tickets on sale, discounted $5 off each tonight, so see Stan Fox. Also mark your calendars, please, for November 23rd. That's our 14th annual wine tasting. It includes a silent auction, food, desserts, and also new this year to this event, the Festival of Trees. So you can bid on a pre-decorated Christmas tree, take it home with you, we'll even valet that tree home for you if you need to. And it's also a fundraiser for our scholarship funds. I know it's a little early to think about the Christmas and holiday season, 
then just in case, December 7th is our 31st annual kind of for Christmas parade. This year's theme is a story time Christmas. Got some fans in the room for the parade. It's a good thing. We also will have markets that day too, so please mark your calendar for December 7th at 1.30. Our parade will start. And if you're looking for a way to help people affected by this 500-year flood, basically, there's a fundraiser going on right now on Channel 6. That's our PBS station. And all the media outlets are focusing and having them do a fund drive. Because as you know, PBS and NPR and those folks know how to do a pledge drive. But this one will help flood victims affected in our area. And I'll try to keep you posted as well as how we can help our sister town, downtown Evergreen, that was affected also, as well as some of the residents along Upper Bear Creek, etc. I hope to have a chance to talk with you after the presentation. Come see me. Free maps, t-shirts at a great price. And thank you again for shopping locally. Thank you, Don. Some exciting things going on. Okay, next I have Erica Armstrong. Is it still Armstrong, Erica? Okay. <laughs> Just kind of got married. Um, okay, so Erica is a board member for Fund for Area Council, and she's going to talk about um, some of the developments going on. You've got that on your, you know, hope to your agenda, but also a little bit about Connect to Colorado. Erica? Hello. So on the back of your um, town hall meeting page is a list of all the developments that are going on in the community. As you can see quietly now, I know the economy is recovering, but the business owners are still holding their breath. So the only changes we have on here are pretty minor. There's like commercial development changes. The trail busters on 285, they're asking for church use of their facilities. Down at Shaker's Crossing by the Fish Pond, they're asking to um, develop a campground down there. There's a couple of residential developments that are very minor. And the only other addition I have is down here is information about the uh, Connect for Colorado. Uh, so it's uh, Connect for Colorado, the new insurance marketplace for individuals to buy health insurance at reasonable rates, will open on October 1st. It's a brand new way to buy insurance. And most existing health plans like Rocky Mountain Health Plan, Anthem, Kaiser are offering a variety of different levels of, co of coverage. We have more information on the brochure back, or the brochure people back there, but the Mountain Resource Center is going to be a source of information and help for this uh, new program. They said to give them a couple more weeks before they will actually take appointments, because if you call them up, they will sit down with you and walk you through the whole entire um, plan. So if you give them a call, they'll walk you through that, and that's all I have for tonight. Wow. Thank you, Erica. And next we have Brian Mosby. Um, Brian is the um, Patron Experience Supervisor, is that right? <laughs> New title, Patron Experience Supervisor for the Conifer Library. And he's to talk just a little bit about what's going on at the library. Thank you. Good evening. I just have a couple of uh, quick announcements about the library. Uh, I did want to say a big thank you to the community. We've got a Lego club going this week, this summer, and it's been a huge success. Uh, so the donations, the support, the parents bringing out the kids, uh, it's really worked well, so well that they've asked me to continue it. So I do have new dates up until December, and we're going to continue the Lego club once a month into 2014. So we're, we were getting about 60 people showing up each time in the summer ones. We're now getting about 25, which is still great. So if you have a young, young one, uh, toddlers up to about eighth grade, uh, they come out, build some incredible things, we put them in our display case so everybody can see them. Uh, this Saturday, we have a high altitude baking program. So if you're interested in all those problems that you might have baking at these high altitudes. Randy Levine is going to be there. She's our high altitude baking specialist. She's written a couple of books on the subject. Uh, she's quite a character. Should be very lively and she promises great treats. So, uh, and a couple of other reminders. Don't forget baby time. Uh, it's 11 o'clock Saturdays. Story time on 11.30 for older kids, 2 to 5. And then we do have a book club now for adults. It is the last Tuesday of each month. Uh, we try and keep the books with the kind of award-winning books. Uh, 
we will be having that next Tuesday on the 24th and then again in October, November, and so on. And don't forget, we do have downloadable books on our site. If you need help with that, we're, we're keeping up with technology. We're learning fast how to do that. So, thank you. Thanks, Brian. We are going to mix it up just a tiny bit. Um, we're going to go ahead and get an update regarding the Conifer Recreation Coalition. Um, Tuki Nimtak is here to give that update. Tuki. Thank you. Conifer Recreation Coalition. So, who is this group? I'm going to play two roles here, so bear with me in case I skip the slides. We're, we are introducing now a program, we've been working on this for about a year, and right now we're introducing a brand new program, it's called... <laughs> it's called, hang on. <laughs> Place. So find your place in the Conifer area. Place stands for public lands, activities, communities, and experiences. What exactly is recreation in the Conifer area? First, I always start my discussions by making it abundantly clear this is not about a rank district. So those of you who have your hackles up can put them down because we're not even we're not even having that discussion. That is not what this is about. So what is it? What is rec recreation in Conifer? It's trails, facilities, historic places, local events, and our abundance of outdoor recreation opportunities. So just a little bit about this. Um, who is Conifer Recreation? It's a group of citizens and organizations that came together to discuss amazing recreational assets and opportunities in the area. So this fall, as I mentioned, we're rolling out this new program. It's called Project Place. So what is Project Place? It's a citizen initiative. Um, it is... This is where I have to refer to my notes, so go ahead and read it. Citizen Initiative that studies the recreational resources of the area and develops strategies for improving the assets and opportunities and enhancing promotion and packaging of these. We can, these are what we have, hope that we can offer to residents, people who are, that, who are traveling through. Project Place will assist recreation, current recreation providers in, with opportunities to coordinate their effort, create mutually beneficial relationships. It's a master plan is what it is. And it's to serve as a platform for existing groups to use in finding their funding. as we can muster. We're going to be meeting three times in public forum meetings throughout the course of this project and the course of developing this master plan. We're asking for your help. We want help in compiling a list of what's special and what's fun to do in the Conifer area. We want great, uh, great pictures. We want to know what your favorite picnic areas are. We want sunset views in your pictures. We want to know where you go for bike rides. We want to know trails that you think that your neighbors uh, would enjoy or you're out of town guests. When you're out of this is how I think of it. When my out of town guests come in town, what do I where do I take them? What do we do? Those are the kind of things that we need feedback from you. The Conifer uh, Recreation Coalition's objective uh, with the project place is to identify what people really want in terms of recreational experiences and then to develop strategies for improving upon what we already have. And so let's get involved. Uh, sign up, come on over, sign up, give me your email list, 
And as we develop this plan, you'll be able to see how things roll out. And you'll have a say in it. Again, we want you to send us your pictures. And if there's any that you'd like to share, please just send them to conquercoalition at gmail.com. Stay in touch with us. Hit our Facebook page, like us, and uh, you'll see as things develop exactly what's going on with this. Thank you. Thanks, Tookie. Okay, now we're going to go back to Jefferson County Public Schools. Um, as you probably all know, know, there are our school board elections coming up, and um, legislative um, information will be here tonight. Um, we have six candidates that are running for the school board. All were invited tonight. Um, there were only only two, well, kind of one and a half are here so far. We've got another one coming. Um, but if you would come up at this point, we're just going to introduce them. They're not going to be campaigning, speaking, or anything tonight. The school board um, candidates are Tanya Altman Betridge. She will not be here tonight. Julie Williams will not be here, but she is being represented by Donna Jack, right here. And then we have Jeff Lamontine, okay, right here. Um, John Newkirk, I believe, will be here a little bit later. Then we also have Gordon Spud Vandewater and Ken Witt. Now, the candidates will be out in the lobby area during the open house. They will not be campaigning, but if you want to go up to them, get literature from them, talk to them, anything, you are certainly welcome to do so. Okay? Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce Wendy Woodland. She's not totally new to the, the area. She's been at the um, West Jefferson Elementary School for three years. Is that correct? This is her third year, but we've never had her at one of our town hall meetings, and we wanted to make sure that all of you here tonight got to meet her. So this is Wendy. So how about a round of applause for our most <laughs> And Wendy's going to talk for just a couple minutes. Um, <laughs> regarding the legislative le legislation that is happening um, regarding schools and she's going to just talk about the facts. Wendy? Hello, thanks for everyone for being here and thanks for the Conifer Area Council for putting this together. Um, I um, am the principal at West Jeff Elementary and for those of you who, I know there's a lot going on in schools and you might not know what's going on in schools, I invite you to give me a call, set up a visit, come and see what we're doing. There are great things happening in schools and I'd love for you to have a chance to see them. This is your personal invitation. Okay, um, I am going to talk about Amendment 66. These are facts and I just want to tell everyone on the back table, there is a form that, that, that I printed off of the internet. Full disclosure, it is off of the website that does support this. I just want you to know, and it talks about what you would pay, what we'd be able to. Again, I do your own research on it. I just, that was the only place I could find some of those things. Amendment 66 is a, I'm just going to kind of read to you, I'm sorry, but give you an idea. It's a voter initiated ballot measure to provide funding for pre K through 12 education. It will, it will also, it's also been known as Initiative 22 and Colorado Commits to Kids, and it will fund Senate Bill. Uh, 213 that you may have heard of, um, also called the Future School Finance Act of 2013. If passed, the following things will be funded in schools in 2015 and 16. Preschool for at-risk three, four, and five-year-olds, full-day kindergarten for all students, more funding for our gifted and talented programs, more funding for at-risk and English language learners, Funding to cover federally mandated special education, which is now being covered through general fund in most school districts. It will provide $441 per students in Jefferson County public schools. It's different for all school districts across the state to um, implement un some unfunded legislative requirements around accountability, the educator effectiveness, which is teacher evaluations every year for every teacher 
and um, the READ Act, which is about making sure all of our students are reading at grade level by third grade, Common Core, which I'm sure you've heard about, um, and new online assessments, um, and any other mandates uh, that are being funded funded through general fund. Over time, revenues increase. As they increase, the 441 will be increased to 600 per student. I hope you, you got all this right. Um, special education funding will increase. Charter schools will have access to capital construction dollars from the state, um, as well as increases in per student funding passed through the district. Um, and Amendment 66 will generate about $1 billion which can only be invested in education. Jeff Jefferson County Public Schools will see anywhere between 72 million and 100 and 105 million uh, per year over time. Revenues are generated through a tiered tax, which means you pay a certain rate on the first portion up to 75,000 and an additional rate above that. We'll look into that. I'm not 100% clear on that myself, sorry to say. Um, individuals currently earning 75000 or under will see an increase of 0.37% in state income tax. Individuals earning over 75000 will see the same 0.37% for that, 75000 and then on the additional 1.27%. So it is um, an income tax there. And at 66, I'm watching Angela for time. Okay. It supersedes other tax reforms, and it would remove an automatic cost of living provision, provision from law. It also exempts any new income generated from Tabor refund limits. If Amendment 66 passes, 43% of the state's general fund will be designated for pre-K through 12 investment. Under the new Finance Act, there will be a return on investments report, more principal control and reporting on spending, and higher accountability and transparency requirements. And the last part here is, um, if it passes, revenues collected before July 1st, 2015 will be reserved as follows. 40% to the pre-K through 12 reserve fund, 15% to Educator Effectiveness Reserve Fund, 5% to the Education Technology Reserve Fund, 40% for Capital Construction Assistance, and to, to help make sure all schools can support um, kindergarten for all students. So um, in the, again, just so you know, it doesn't say it at the top, but this is the form that I did get off the website if you have more questions, and um, like all things, I would encourage you to do your own research on that. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy, and welcome. <laughs> okay, the girls at West Jefferson Elementary are doing some really fun things right now. It's called Girls on the Run. Anne Point and a couple of others are going to be talking about that. So, Anne. We were so excited to be invited to talk about a very um, positive, <laughs> impacting program at West Jeff Elementary. Um, myself and my fellow coach, Heather Malcolm, <coughs> along with two other wonderful ladies, um, are coaching a group of wonderful girls um, for Girls on the Run. Girls on the Run is a national program uh, that was started back on the East Coast by a gal who was a social worker in a school. And it really isn't a running club. It uses running as a backdrop. Um, it's really about <coughs> empowering girls to have confidence and make healthy choices in their life. It's a program that starts in grade three and goes all the way up through grade eight. Um, this year is our second um, year we have 22 wonderful little girls who are so excited and are coming out and practicing with us twice a week and we'll be um, getting ready to run a 5k race at the end of I guess in the middle of November so it's pretty exciting 
So I'm Heather Malcolm. I'm the school social worker at West Jeff Elementary. I'm Samara. So Samara is in third grade and her sister is in fifth grade. So she was kind of a girls on the run in training last year, tagging along with mom and um, older sister Chloe. Um, tell us how many races you won. One. Um, walked and ran. Two. And actually I'm remembering a third one. So our team last year um, I just thought of a third one. So last year in the fall, part of the Girls on the Run curriculum is to do a service project. So we talked with the girls about giving back to the community and trying to keep it really local. Um, because we're a running group, we really felt like Emily's Run would be a great run for us to participate in. Um, I live in Bailey, and so, um, of course, with all of us, we know that that, that event really touched all of us. Um, her parents and the I Love You Guys Foundation really created an amazing foundation that supports our local, our local community. 13, Step 13, it's the Mountain Resource Center, the Peace Shelter, a variety of places, organ and tissue donation, scholarships for, at Columbine and at Black Canyon High School. They just do amazing work. The major thing that I have really been impressed by <clears throat> is John Michael Key's work with the Columbine Symposium and School Safety and the SRP, the School Response Protocol, that all schools now in Jeffco utilize, and it really has tightened up our sense of safety and security and taught children what to do in a case of an emergency. And so we really, that has been a very valuable thing for all of our schools. And so last year we did kind of a spirit week and kids could bring money um, to wear a hat um, in honor of Emily. And we raised $160. We had many families join us for the race and um, we made a lot of money that way. We're doing that again this year. And then we participated in the elevation race and then we do our girls on the run race at the end of the fall and in May. So it's been a huge goal that many of our girls have made about being able to run a 5K. Thank you. How exciting. I wish my daughter could have been involved in that when she was in elementary school. I'm, I'm, I hope you are as happy to hear about that as I am. I think that's very cool. Um, okay, next we have Elk Creek Fire Department. Um, Bill McLaughlin, Chief Bill McLaughlin, is going to talk just a little bit about um, what Elk Creek has been up to and what you need to know for the election. Bill? Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the information uh, that you would need to know uh, prior to uh, the proposed uh, mill levy that's coming up uh, uh, this fall. To start with, um, give you a little bit of uh, background on how the fire district gets its funding. Um, you know, a lot of folks I know are not, uh, you know, not aware that all of our funding is local. We don't get any funding from the county or the state or the federal government except, uh, you know, for the occasional grant. So our funding essentially is 75% uh, um, property taxes, about 20% uh, uh, ambulance revenue from uh, you know, billing insurance for ambulance uh, services. Um, grants and donations uh, you know, make up a big chunk of what's uh, left of there. Donations, uh, unfortunately, are only about 1% of, uh, of our total budget. And uh, then, you know, just some miscellaneous uh, income. I do know that uh, there's been some uh, discussion around the community about uh, $200,000 or various numbers that have been thrown around that uh, was in excess of last year's budget. And to explain that, it's not actually shown in this, but last year, because of all the fires that we had around Colorado, we actually were reimbursed $236,000 uh, for helping various uh, other departments or the Fed, federal government, or the state on various fires. Of that, about 115000 went to expenses such as personnel and other things, which left actually a fairly good amount of money 
that was reimbursed to us for the equipment that we used to go into our equipment replacement fund. So in that respect, uh, last year was actually a, a pretty solid uh, budget year for Elk Creek, but uh, that was primarily because we spent a lot of the year uh, fighting fires. If we look just at the tax revenue uh, for uh, Elk Creek Fire, you can see that over the past uh, several years, uh, the tax revenues have dropped about 16%, and we have the assessment for 2014-2015 uh, in, and it's a 4% decrease from uh, this year. So uh, what we're seeing is uh, you know much, much tighter budget as we move forward. To uh, deal with uh, those budget cuts uh, that we've had to make, uh, we've, uh, we've been scaling back the services that the fire department uh, has available. Um, in the last year, we cut uh, two and a half out of 12 positions, which included our fire marshal and our training officer. Uh, we cut the cost of benefits to our uh, firefighters. Uh, we've sold several of our vehicles. We've done a lot of cuts that I know wasn't really popular when I told the crews they couldn't have coffee anymore, but you know, that's what you gotta do. And we've uh, started to uh, use what reserves we have. And at this point we have basically, um, you know, spent uh, as much out of our reserves as we can safely do. This uh, unfortunately is really bad timing for that because in next year, every 10 years, the fire department is graded on our uh, capability. And that grading is used to uh, essentially set your fire insurance rates. And so this is terrible timing for that because a lot of those cuts, unfortunately, are going to impact how that uh, grading is uh, done. Uh, grading goes from a class one to a class 10. Uh, Elk Creek has had an outstanding rating the best in uh, the area up until now at a class five. Um, with, if you, basically, homeowners are paying about 20% less than they would be uh, if, uh, you know, uh, in some of the other departments that don't have that, uh, that class five rating. Uh, it's gonna be very difficult for us to keep that class five moving into next year for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is that uh, out of four engines, one of them is not going to be counted anymore because it's reached the maximum life that they will consider a fire engine as being uh, qualified. So once it hits 25 years, they, they just write it off and uh, so essentially they're going to say, you know, that fire engine and the two other <coughs> trucks are not, uh, you know, not uh, applicable to our grading. Uh, likewise, the cuts that we made, unfortunately, are also going to impact that grading. Uh, you know, if we, one of the things that they measure is, you know, whether we have a full-time training officer, how much hours the, uh, the firefighters uh, put in training, uh, whether we have a full-time fire prevention officer, and unfortunately, each of those things that we've had to cut is going to impact that uh, insurance rating. Uh, so, uh, the board, in looking at this, um, has elected to go ahead and put a mill levy proposition on the ballot. The, um, the current mill levy is 4.91 mills and uh, has been since Tabor was enacted in 1992. So there has not been a, uh, a tax increase since uh, it was first required that it be approved by, um, by the uh, voters. That uh, mill levy is the lowest in either Parker or uh, Jefferson County by a lot. Uh, currently, uh, you know, at 4.9 mills, uh, the owner of a $300,000 house pays about $117 a year, so it's a very small part of the tax bill that you get each year, as compared with, for example, if you live down in Lakewood where you're paying uh, about $328. Under the proposed increase, the mill levy for Elk Creek would still be the lowest in either Jefferson or Park County. Uh, and it would be about $176 for a uh, $300,000 house. So essentially, for a $300,000 house, 
the increase would be about $60 a year or $4.98 a month. The money would go to uh, basically restoring one of the positions. So uh, what we are proposing to do would be to have uh, one assistant chief who would be the training officer and the fire marshal. Uh, we would not restore the, all of the positions that we cut. Uh, and uh, we would immediately replace those old, the 25-year-old trucks, so that uh, we would be able to uh, qualify them uh, next year for the, uh, the insurance regrading. Uh, one of the other big things that we would be looking at doing is funding protective gear for volunteers. You know, while we have uh, cut a couple of uh, the paid positions, at the same time, we now have more volunteers than we've had in many years, and we have a lot more people in the community who would like to volunteer. Uh, unfortunately, the, you know, even volunteers aren't free. Uh, we have to have the equipment to issue to them, we have to provide them the training, and we have to fund the pension program for them uh, you know, in order to, to take them on. So at this point, you know, we have a good number of volunteers and we're not taking any new, new applications. It's a good thing for us you know, in that we have good staffing, but we would like to get uh, more volunteers as well, especially to make up the, uh, the difference in the other position, the full-time position that we've got. And then finally, uh, we would be looking at both building up a fund to continue replacing apparatus. As I mentioned, we've uh, had to cut uh, the reserve that we normally would use for purchasing apparatus and also to maintain our buildings. Uh, and we need, to, we need to replenish that so that we don't end up in the same situation a couple years down the road when the next few fire engines start reaching the end of their life. So again, that, uh, that position that we would be restoring would be you know, half fire marshal, half training position. So it would be filling the two positions just in one, one person. And the primary job that that person has is recruiting and training the volunteers. That's, that's pretty much what we want to do. Uh, the other big thing with that is that, again, it would help that insurance rating to have that position back on. With uh, this plan, we're also looking at you know streamlining our operations. Uh, you know, we uh, when I started with Elk Creek, we had 24 different uh, fire engines and trucks and everything, and uh, that's a lot. It's a lot of maintenance costs, a lot of insurance costs. So as we're uh, moving forward with this, we're also work, you know moving to a more efficient model. Uh, one of those is that instead of having you know a big structure engine, a city engine and a brush truck at every station uh, that you know, combined cost about $750,000. We're gonna look at uh, replacing those with a single mid-sized truck that would uh, essentially cost half that amount. So as we move forward, you know, what I wanna do is cut the overall cost for us to maintain. You know, right now we've got about $4 million replacement cost in all the fire engines. I want to cut that down to about $3 million and then we have less issue with trying to maintain and replace those apparatus as we move forward. Another rumor that's gone around town has been that this uh, bill levy proposal would be to add union firefighters. Uh, we're not looking at adding any positions that would be eligible for the union. That training officer as a chief officer would not be eligible. And then uh, secondly, uh, you know, in the state of Colorado, uh, you know, there, the only way for, for a union to exist in a fire department is if 50% of the residents of the fire district vote to allow them to have collective bargaining. So while our firefighters belong to the International Association of Firefighters, uh, they, do, they do not have a union contract, they do not have any of the bargaining abilities that city firefighters do. Uh, we would be adding more volunteers. We'd be looking at you know, the uh, protective clothing and training that we need you know, to get those volunteers on board. Okay, and that's pretty much uh, what I've got to talk about. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And now,
Carol Jennifer with Creekside Insurance is going to take just a minute or two to talk about what the impact of the election would be on your insurance. Jennifer? Thank you. I promise I'll be your quickest speaker ever tonight. Um, I'm just here to reiterate exactly what she said. I actually am a local insurance agent. I have great relationships with my colleagues in the uh, community as well. So I can speak from the many companies that I represent as well as many of the single company agents like State Farm, Allstate, American Family. Many of you may have already known this, but insurance is getting increasingly difficult to purchase up here. And I can truly tell you, it is a fact. If we lose our fire rating here, your insurance rates will go up. That is not in dispute by any stretch. Insurance companies are getting very sophisticated. They're looking at how close you are to brush fire. So I do want to dispel one myth. There's a myth out there that, well, my insurance company doesn't look at my ISO, my ISO rating. They don't care if I'm a one or a 10. They look at a brush hazard map. I can tell you part of that mapping includes your protection class. It includes how quickly the fire department can respond, what their access to water is. So I encourage you to call your agents and ask them what would happen if I lose my rating. They can give you the information particular to your uh, policy, but I can truly tell you, no matter how your company looks at it, they're also, like I said, looking at how close you are to brush fire. They, it is so uh, sophisticated now that they can GPS down and see if you are 500 feet to a thick wooded area, are you 1,000 feet? They will look at that, they'll take into account what your ISO protection class is, and they'll also look at how many trees are around your house, may ask you to cut trees down. So it is going to be difficult, not impossible, but uh, the rates will change. The rates will change if we lose our rating. So we need to keep our, our department strong, we need to keep them with good equipment, uh, as Chief said, and um, like I said before, call your agents. They can give you a little bit more specific information and probably confirm what you're hearing tonight. So I thank you very much. And I'll be here afterwards, so if you have any general questions about insurance, don't hesitate to come up to me. I'll stay after the meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, some of you may have been wondering what their, um, that big chair is doing in the middle. Um, and there's a lot of other things going on. Portland Coffee is here to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that Journey Church has been up to. All right. And I'm actually, what we plan to do here is actually show a short video uh, that kind of gives a broad scope of several things that are going on at Journey Church, uh, just to kind of give the broadest update. And if people have specific questions about something specific afterwards, uh, I will try to answer those as you best as I can. Um, yeah, good. I actually, we actually don't know if this is going to work, so everyone across your fingers. We didn't uh, get here in time to test. Uh, so what, what this is, is we're working on a video project for our five-year anniversary. We're about to be five years old as a church here in Conifer. And uh, so we've been putting a video together, and this is not quite complete. It was, uh, it's in its rough stage. But like I said, it just kind of gives the best broad scope of uh, what's going on here. I also, unfortunately, don't have a hookup for audio, so we're going to try to run it through these speakers. And I'm going to put this mic up to it, and we're going to see how it works, all right? So everyone's going to bear with me here as we have uh, an adventure with technology, all right? like Angry Loma Dining, which serves breakfast and lunch to hundreds of community members every week. All the money from the Angry Loma goes to support our student program serving kids in all our mountain communities. Two years ago, we launched the Mountain Roads Driving School, which is a state-credited, fully certified driving school supplying driver's education and behind-the-wheel training to hundreds of students since the beginning. Mountain Roads Driving School is run by Journey staff and volunteers and has been able to scholarship dozens of students through their program thanks to the generosity of our members. We are currently opening a second location in the Everett area. We'll soon be franchising the school to churches and nonprofits all over the country who are looking to duplicate what we've done. All proceeds from the Mountain Roads Driving School go to fund our student programs in the community. Just this last year, we launched a new journey project called First Punch Graphics and Marketing. We've opened up our design departments through this venture to begin developing and marketing and designing for businesses and organizations 
here in Colorado and nationwide. As part of this project, we do full service, large format printing of everything from signs and banners to billboards and car wraps. A part of First Class Graphics is our screen printing company, printing custom t-shirts for our schools, clubs, businesses, and organizations, churches, and even more. The money from First Punch Graphics and marketing goes to help innovative churches get going all over the country. We've helped to fund churches start here in Colorado, in Denver, Colorado Springs, and Pueblo, and nationwide in California, Michigan, Arkansas, and more. We've been able to help almost 30 churches in all since our beginning. We started publishing and distributing books nationwide through our independent publishing company, First Punch Press. The publishing company is a way for us to tell our story and spread our message as well as to find and promote great stories from around the nation. This year we're releasing titles by authors like Michael Cheshire, Tony Ferraro, Jonathan Rosenzog, and more. We just recently opened two licensed U-Haul dealerships, serving Conifer and Evergreen. The U-Haul dealerships put us in proximity to newcomers in our community and give us the opportunity to meet them and offer any help we can to them getting plugged into our community. The U-Haul dealership will also help funding our Journey Helps initiative. Journey Helps Ministries have been running since we opened our doors and to this day have helped thousands with the essential needs like food, clothing, and transportation. The Journey Food Bank is supplied by the donations of Journey members and the Food Bank of the Rockies. We have supplied food to over 500 families over our five years and are about to launch a new food bank center that will be set up as a grocery store for those who use the food bank to shop and choose their items rather than being pre-assigned. At Journey, we believe there is dignity and choice and are excited to have this as an option for people in our city. In 2014, we are planning to launch a brand new HELPS initiative facility where we will have dental and eye care suites to provide free care to low-income families. The Journey Car Ministry is a team of men and women who come together weekly to fix up cars and trucks for single moms and low-income families who are in desperate need of transportation. In our five years of existence, we've given over 100 cars away to provide transportation to those in need. Cars are donated by community members and fixed up by our cars team, replacement by our health ministry. The Journey Response Team is made up of 226 men and women who have volunteered to be on call in the case of a natural disaster or community emergency. The response team provides support and relief in the event of fire, snowstorm, and most recently, flooding. We have worked closely with the Red Cross teams in the past fires, including the Lower North Fork Fire, where we supplied and served food for the evacuation center for the extent of the fire. This last year, we closed on the purchase of our close to 50 acre piece of property, bordering Conifer High School right off the of Seventh Street. We call it the Journey Ranch, and it is all being paid up to be turned into community use space. We developed over a mile of trail property which ties into the Conifer Trails project, giving students a place to walk through our property from Conifer High School. We put in a disc golf course that is used daily by people in our community and even the PE class in Conifer High School. And our fields in the front of the property are already being used as practice space for our local Little League football and cross team. Our dream is to build a facility on the top part of this property that will serve as a rec center for our community. And we're getting closer to that dream every week. Although still a year or two away, the Journey Rec Center will be a place for the community to gather, open to people from all walks of life, faiths, and backgrounds. We'll have the fitness rooms, three full gyms, movie theaters, a bowling alley, breakout rooms, and more. We want the Rec Center to be an asset for all of our This last summer, we started a new program called Journey Youth Board. Journey Youth Board was 35 high school students and college students that worked they worked in all of our businesses and through leadership development training and team building training in the process. We saw these students grow and strive into confident and influential leaders in their schools and their city with the knowledge and experience to not only start and run businesses, but also the motivation to start something that makes an impact. We've been able to do quite a bit over the last five years, but know that the youth of our community is who will be moving us forward 10 to 15 years down the road. We're excited to see where we will be then. Until then, we'll keep holding on tight and inviting anyone who might feel a little daring to join with us. You can get connected with Journey Church by visiting us online at journeyfoothills.com. We hope to see you around soon, and until then, remember, you matter to God, and you matter to us. All right.
Wow. Thank you, Corliss. Um, the Conifer Area Council Trails team has been pretty busy also, and Susie Nielsen, um, Conifer Area Council board member, is going to talk a little bit about what they've been up to. Susie. Thank you, Shirley. It's been a great summer for us. The Conifer Area Council's trail team and board would like to bring you up to date on the progress that we've made since our last town hall. The trails team, in partnership with Jefferson County, recently completed the underpass trail link. It's in front of King Supers. You probably all recall that there was construction in the underpass in the early summer. Well, in the next few weeks, a pedestrian crosswalk will be painted on Conifer Road at its intersection with Davis Avenue completing this project. The completion of the underpass trail allows easy passage to the south side of Aspen Park and the new entrance to Meyer Ranch open space. The opening of this link was celebrated this summer with the first annual Elevation Celebration 5K that was put on by the Chamber. The trails team was approached by two young men who were on track to become Eagle Scouts. Well, both of these outstanding guys, leaders, completed their projects and added enormous contributions to the trails project and the community. Patrick Riley, who was unable to be here tonight, one of the Eagle Scouts, completed a trail segment connecting the Conifer Area High School athletic fields with a neighboring trail on the Journey Church property. This connection allows Conifer High School track team members to run on trails through the woods between Conifer High School and Flying J Ranch rather than along Highway 73. Thank you, Patrick, for your efforts in working with the trails team and in building this essential community trail link. Thanks to the Journey Church's generosity for allowing and encouraging this connection with the community trails, benefiting the students as well as all of us who like to hike. The second Eagle Scout candidate is Cole Wagonhalls. Cole. <laughs> Cole built the first Conifer Community Trails trailhead sign and installed it at the entrance to the junior students parking lot at Conifer High School. The high school administration allowed the lot to be a designated trailhead. Cole also built a bench along the new trail link. We're very grateful to Patrick and to Cole and to Conifer High School for these great additions to the trails. And we're planning to, addi to um, help additional Eagle Scout projects and are working with two mountain area scout troops on trail maintenance. The focus for the rest of the year is to raise matching funds for the next trail segment. Trails was awarded the Conifer Newcomers and Neighbors Holiday Boutique Silent Auction, which will take place on November 2nd at Conifer High School. We are gathering donations, running the auctions, and using the proceeds for future trail development. We will very gratefully accept promises of donations tonight at the trails table at the end of the meeting. In 2014, the trails team will begin working on connections between West Jeff Elementary and Conifer High School. Some parts of this route are set and others are also being determined right now. The goal is to have trails connecting the community so that it's possible to walk, hike, or bike from one part of Conifer to another. We're thrilled with progress being made and hope you enjoy a walk around town soon. And we welcome anyone who would like to join um, our trails team. We meet the fourth Wednesday of each month at 6 o'clock p.m. in the Conifer Library meeting room. Thank you. Thank you, Susie, and thanks to um, Pat and to Patrick and to Cole. Wonderful job, that's great. Um, okay, now we have Light the Lights by Club. And Katie Bartajay is going to be um, talking about that. And she's also <coughs> graciously worked the computer tonight. Technology is always <coughs> iffy. We never know for sure what's going to work, but it worked tonight. Thanks, Katie. I had nothing to do with the Journey Church beautiful commercial that they had, so that was great. Thank you. Um, I'm Katie Bartajay. I'm one of the vice presidents of uh, the uh, Conifer Lobos Unified Booster. It's a booster <coughs> club um, at the high school, but it's um, our focus is on all sports and all athletics. So we don't um, work with just one type of team or one type of activity, but we really try to focus on what the best overall help for the school could be, um, what they need, and how we can how we can help. In the past, we've um, helped establish the Mountain Bowl with our uh, neighboring Evergreen um, rivals, and we helped um, initiate homecoming at our at our home field. 
Um, it used to be that every homecoming was down at the uh, Jeffco Stadium down in Lakewood, so we're happy that we can keep our, our families and our students up here for homecoming. Um, we help with bleachers and fencing, and we um, provide concessions as a service, and we work with our parents to, to manage the concession booths. So that's something that the club does for all the sports that are offering concessions. So um, a few years ago, though, we realized that we can help out in a lot of little ways, but the biggest way we can help out is to try to keep um, like, a, uh, like a common goal between us, the administration, and the district, and our students. And um, in doing so, we uh, came up with a master plan. We worked with the school district at Jeffco and the administration to come up with what the biggest needs were for the students. Um, talk to coaches and, and parents. And one of the big things that had been, been talked about for a long time was lights, um, team rooms too, because if anybody's been to our main field, they realize that you know there's really nowhere for the students to go in bad weather, um, or the players, even uh, younger students, uh, the youth sports use those facilities as well. Um, so some of those things, we have a multi-phased um, approach to our master plan. Our, our most important phases, or our original phase one, is lights at the main field, team rooms, and concession and ticketing. Um, and then the future phases would be track enhancements and some additional practice field enhancements. Um, all things to keep the students um, safe and have good amenities. Uh, we are a 501c3, so all of our donations are, are um, tax exempt, and we um, are doing all this work with da from donations and grants. It's not uh, a tax money or, or district funded. So, um, so the master plan, really the benefits to students were the increased black practice time if we could get lights at that main field. Even if they're only on for an hour, that gives, you know, potentially seven hours of, of additional practice and play time. The, uh, the practice field is uh, regular grass and in bad inclement weather, they can't play on it. Um, the snow, I think, I think there was, uh, I want to say like almost a hundred games that were, or practices that were moved because of the weather last year. I don't know if that's right, but it may be. I know it was quite a bit because we had a lot of heavy spring snows. Um, and then the main field is turf, so it has a little bit more uh, versatility. Um, we also want to try to keep the students um, from driving down into town as much um, for games and practices. So that's uh, one way of doing it is to increase the amenities um, at the school. And um, the benefits to the community, too, would be that all uh, parents of the students um, are now visiting our local businesses up here instead of doing their, you know, shopping or their their oil changes down in, uh, you know, in Lakewood or Littleton, and, and so really keeping it a, a community, um, keeping our our people, our residents, and our students in the community as much as they can. Um, so our main goal is to get lights um, at the main field, um, hopefully this summer if we can raise the remaining funds. Um, this is just an overview, and we have some more information back at the booth if you have any uh, specific questions. We've been working with an architect and an engineering firm um, on this master plan, and they also helped us with the engineering for this first phase, um, which has been a significant investment on the club's part at this point, um, financial and time-wise. Um, we have worked extensively with them to pick lighting and, and specify light posts and technologies that are downcasting, um, that reduce spill, that are dark skies friendly, that are on timers so that you know immediately after practice is done or the game, the Friday night game is over, you know they could turn the lights off um, as soon as people get safely out of the parking lot. And of course, we're also looking at you know um, pathway lighting and spectator lighting as well because you can't just light the main field. Um, and it's, it can be a little dangerous at that point, so we have to make sure we've got traffic flow in and out. Um, and um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we've done so far. Um, we had the master plan that was um, agreed upon and designed uh, by the district, the administration of the club, and um, that was done about a year and a half ago. Um, we have had uh, public meetings with the adjacent property owners. Um, the, the district supplied us with a, a list of people that we had to, and then um, we had the survey complete, and we've um, been working with contractors. So if you have more questions, let me know. We're looking for money, uh, of course, but we're uh, 176,000 raised and about 100,000 to go. So thank you. Thanks, Katie.
And we are now so very honored to have Representative Sherry Jerome here with us. Um, she's going to share a little bit about the legislature and nature and what is going on there. Sherry. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. I want to give you a quick update on what's going on with the floods. Um, you are probably aware, and I don't know if any of you on this side uh, were impacted by the floods. Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Um, and you probably saw what happened in Neverween. We also had issues in um, Kittredge. And then I've heard from, there are areas up in uh, the northern part of House District 25, which is actually on the Jeffco Boulder border. So Colquitt Canyon, um, north of Golden Gate Park, that area also had flooding. Uh, the, the state is responsible for the infrastructure of the bridges that they have constructed. And then the federal government will be coming in because it was declared as uh, an emergency. The federal government will be giving us FEMA dollars for some of those projects. We don't know how much we'll be spending and we don't know how much the feds are going to be giving um, based on, we have to do a needs assessment to find out just how many bridges were and roads were um, impacted. And then once we have that assessment done, then we're going to figure out what the, the building plan is. We have roughly $32 million in the Tabor Reserve, which is a pot of funds that we keep at the, at the state just to take care of issues such as this. Then we have $40 million in the uh, reserve that we are constitutionally required, we're required to have a 4% reserve by, by the state constitution. But last year, because we had extra dollars, we bumped that another 1%, so that brought that up to, it's, it's 20 million, so, or excuse me, um, 40 million. So we've got roughly 72 million. We also have about 30 million more that we could get into and start digging in further into the state budget. We hope not to do that. Um, I did read today that if you have flood insurance and um, you had an issue that you may be eligible for FEMA dollars. Uh, I don't have the details on that. I've been working with Udall and Bennett's offices on um, issues that I have with constituents that did have some severe flooding. Other than that, I've been touring prisons um, this summer. We, uh, you may recall when I was chair of the Joint Budget Committee year before last, um, we closed a prison, and we did because our prison population has been going down. Uh, since that closure, there are about 400 more prisoners in the system than were in the system uh, before the closure. I believe there could be an association with that number of prisoners with the assassination of uh, Director Clements. You may recall call it Tom Clements was uh, murdered uh, outside his home last year, and he was the director of corrections. So we're not exactly sure what's happening with those populations, but we do know that we need to stay good, vigilant on it. This, um, we, one of the other things I did besides closing the prison that year was I commissioned a prison utilization study, which basically is studying the populations and determining um, where the different populations go. On Monday, I, we went through CSP, which is the Colorado State Penitentiary in Canyon City, and then CSP2, which is the prison that we closed, we are in negotiations with the federal government to rent out CSP2 to the feds for either um, ICE um, individual immigration individuals or we're talking to the state of California to see if perhaps they might want to um, rent some prison cells to take care of their prisoners, some of theirs. In California, if the prisoner doesn't want to be sent out of state, uh, they cannot send them out of state, so they would have to be volunteers that would want to come to Colorado. The good news about that is if we can utilize that space, it will save the state of Colorado $20 million. So basically that's it. I'll be around. Um, I appreciate your, um, your work here, everybody. You guys are always so fabulous. Uh, you probably saw that we did give some dollars out on the lower North Fork. Uh, not enough, but we're still working on it. So thank you very much, and it's uh, good to see you all. Thank you, Sherry. Um, okay, so we have an email list for um, everyone that would like to get information about the community. If you would like to be on that email list or not already, Susan Inning is at the back table and she'll take um, you know, she'll get your email address so that we can get you emails about things going on. And as you can tell tonight, there's a lot going on. 
Um, let's see, there is a Rotary Recycle Roundup this Saturday, September 21st. There's information on one of the back tables about that. All the speakers will be available for you to come up and ask questions of and talk to um, in just about a minute. Um, we have sheriff's deputies um, in the back if you would like to ask questions of them. Um, they have answers. Um, school board candidates will be out in the lobby area, so please go and talk to them, find out as much as you can. Um, the next town hall meeting is going to be November 20th. Um, it is the week before Thanksgiving. Um, and we, all donations that we receive tonight, if you'd like to donate, and there's a jar on the table over here, they will go to the local flood victims. So if you'd like to donate to that, we would really appreciate that. And last but not least, I'd like to thank again Sharon Trilk with My Mountain Town for her support of tonight's meeting. Everybody's adjourned. So go talk to the speakers. <laughs>